place of change family it's time for our annual back to school supply giveaway and this year we're going all out everything's new resources community partners fun fellowship food family the only thing we need is you and yours invite someone saturday august the 13th from 11 a.m to 3 p.m right here at the place of change for our annual back to school supply giveaway stay tuned volunteer opportunities are available more information coming soon don't forget our back to school supply giveaway Hey y'all, I'm so excited because fourth Sunday of this month is our family reunion service. And I'm excited because my friend and my brother, Pastor Derry Haywood, is coming to us. And I promise you this, you don't want to miss it. It's going to be an amazing service. The Shekinah glory of the Lord is going to fall. But I'm here because as soon as service is over, you need to get your ticket. Ticket, the biggest ticket for this event is $10. You can go to our website, placeofchange.org. But I'm telling you this, you don't want to miss the food. You don't want to miss the fellowship. But there are some people that I'm calling out. You see, for those who haven't seen the real last year. I took a loss and I promised the Lord what I won't do is lose twice. So yeah, go ahead and get your ticket. It's going to be great food, great fun, but I promise you it's going to be some entertainment. Meet me, fourth Sunday, at the family reunion. Well, hey, y'all. Welcome to the Place of Change. I am so excited because something is happening really big. I mean, like really, really big. And you're not going to want to miss this. It is going down here at the Place of Change, Sunday, July 24th. It is our family reunion Sunday. If you haven't heard, now you heard, all right? So this is going to be an awesome service. You already know that it is because our pastor, Pastor Cedric Rousen, has been laying this series down. So make sure that you are here. But, and I might get in trouble for saying this, but y'all know me. The best part of the service is after service. We are going to have food, fun, fellowship, and music. And if you are anything like me, you are always down for a great time, especially when there's food involved. So, if you haven't heard already, those games are going to be lit. But let me tell y'all about a very special game. This game right here, that everybody that seems to think they know how to play this game is gonna come and find me because they're gonna try to beat me, but you already know. What? It ain't happening? It's never gonna happen. So y'all make sure you buy those tickets. Go to placeofchange.org, buy those tickets because you are not going to want to miss this. All right, y'all, get them phase tens ready. Make sure you're practicing because when you come sit at my table, it's serious. So don't come with no games, but make sure you buy your ticket so that after I beat you, we can go and eat some food together. I love y'all. Make sure you buy your tickets. What's up, family? It's Pastor Sid here. Now listen, nobody asked me to do this, but I'm making an appeal to you. Now, I know you probably don't know what in the world I'm talking about now. But some of you know what it's like to go to a restaurant or <clears throat> a, a bar and to have a mixologist do last call. It means we're getting ready to shut it down and this is your final opportunity to get in while the getting is good. Well, nobody asked me to do this, but I'm appealing to you because we're very excited because our family reunion Sunday is drawing nigh. Here's the problem. Time is running out. We will not have lunch tickets at the door. And I wanna put this word out so that you understand it and so that no one would, would ask the question. You're hearing from the horse's mouth, we will not be making tickets available the day of. So I need you to stop what you're doing and I need you to go to placeofchange.org and buy your lunch tickets now. Buy them now 
so that we can get our head count. We are the, the, the registrations are filling up, but we want you to get your tickets in now because we will not be selling tickets at the door. And uh, as much as we love to, we can't just let people in who do not have a ticket. So if you think you're going to invite your family, you think you got friends you want to come uh, and hang out with us on, on Sunday, then do me the favor. Go right to the website. It's very simple. It's literally on the home page and purchase your lunch ticket okay i cannot wait to celebrate with the family to rejoice to have fun and fellowship around some good food i love you we'll see you there well good evening family what's up thanks for hanging out with me tonight here at the place of change i'm grateful to the lord because we have this unique opportunity to share to grow and to learn together I usually only ask of one major favor, and that is that you would share the post. But I would, I would actually deviate from that tonight to ask for a slightly different favor. If you have not done so, I really would love for you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We are now a little more than 600 subscribers in, and I really want to see um, how quickly we can knock down the door of 750, and then from there, 1,000. So. I need you to do me a favor. If you're watching and you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, just click the subscribe button, turn the um, alerts on, the notifications on, ring the bell. If you are watching us on Facebook, also like our Facebook page, um, follow us on Instagram, Place of Change VA, follow us on Twitter, Place of Change VA. We really want to maximize our online platform. You know, the Bible says go into all the world. Uh, and make disciples of all men. Well, maybe perhaps all the world wasn't by camel or by horse. Maybe all the world includes through digital media and technology. So do me that favor. Even if you don't share this live tonight, I'd love for you to do that. I really want to see you subscribe and follow us on social media. It becomes a hub for us in today's world for you to be able to get access to everything that we are seeking to bless you with through ministry in this modality, all right? You can be a blessing to our church financially and tangibly, and I thank you for that. You don't really have to tell givers to give. The Bible says God gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. When a person is a sower, then they already know what to do with seed. So I thank you, seed sowers, for your continued contributions, your generosity, and your spirit of giving. It enables us to continue to do ministry, to bring you quality ministry, and to be a difference and a light, to be the change uh, in the communities around us, all right? The most important thing you'll be able to do tonight is to give your life to Christ. If you do not know the Lord is your savior, the prompts will be on the screens as to how you can respond to us in, uh, in real time, and you can let us know that you have given your life to the Lord, rededicated your life to the Lord, or if by chance you desire a church home, you also can join our ministry and grow with us as a family, okay? Let's pray. I'm getting ready to get into the word. Lord, thank you tonight because I believe that our time spent together is gonna to be meaningful time. Lord, I pray in this moment that you would anoint my lips of clay, that you would word my mouth, that even beyond just the mere moment of preparation, Lord, I ask that you would get in my thoughts and in my head and down in my spirit until that in which is shared out of my mouth would be a direct reflection of what you want said to your people. I thank you today that our eyes are open and our spirits are attentive and we are ready to receive in Jesus name. Amen. All right. I want you to join me one uh, primary verse of scripture, I may go one or two other places to validate and to help undergird, but one primary verse of scripture, Proverbs 27 and 21 is where we're going to be tonight. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read this from three different translations because I, I want you to really see what it's saying. Proverbs 27, 21. I'm going to first read it out of the NRSV, what they call UE, the updated edition of the NRSV says, the crucible is for silver and the furnace is for gold. So a person is tested by being praised. Mm. The crucible is for silver and the furnace is for gold. So a person is tested by being praised. Now look at the Amplified. The Amplified says the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold to separate the impurities of the metal. 
and each is tested by the praise given to him and his response to it, whether humble or proud. So we're starting to see more here. The message says, the purity of silver and gold is tested by putting them in the fire. The purity of human hearts is tested by giving them a little fame. Ooh, this is good. Now tonight, I'm going to talk from a very interesting but simple title, a simple subject that when you first hear it, you're probably going to think something different, but you got to stick with me for the ride. I want to talk this evening about the power of praise. The power of praise. All right. I'm going to be teaching about the power of praise. Now, I grew up in church, um, proudly grew up in church. I am a church boy and I find nothing wrong with that. But I grew up in church in a time and in an era where they often talked about differences between praise and worship. And, and if you grew up in church or have a church background at all, you may have heard the different thoughts and theories about the differences between praise and worship. And I would hear people say, everybody can praise the Lord, but everybody can't worship the Lord. And we would start going into differences. On a very basic and sad level, sometimes people would think that the difference between praise and worship uh, was simply that the praise was fast and worship was slow. So we have an upbeat song, we'd all sing together and we would be celebratory. And then they say, oh, come on now, let's go into worship. And the idea of let's go into worship was implying that uh, now, now, now we're gonna bring the tempo down and the volume down and, and we're gonna get quiet. That's not necessarily true. Something that may be closer to truth is we will say, well, we praise God for what he's done. I know you heard that one, but we worship for him for who he is. I can get with that. I can get with that. Another one that you may hear would be things like uh, everyone can praise, but only people in relationship can worship. So in other words, the Bible says, let everything that have breath praise ye the Lord. But, but to worship, you have to worship him in spirit and truth. I can get with that too. Okay, great. But I want to offer you one other piece about a difference between praise and worship. While worship is exclusively reserved for devotion to the divine, I want to suggest that praise, on the other hand, is something that can be given to others who are not God. Oh, I got your attention now, don't I? While worship is exclusively reserved as an act of devotion to the divine, an act of worship to God, it's a sign of my devotion to God out of relationship. Praise, on the other hand, can be given in different forms to those who are not God, i.e., in other words, you can show appreciation, adulation, admiration, even affection to people who are not God. Those are all examples of the kinds of praise we often show or demonstrate toward other people. And God is okay with it. I need you to know early in this lesson that God is not insecure to where God uh, gets offended when you show appreciation, adulation, or admiration, or affection to others. If your child plays a sport and they do well, then when you praise that child, appreciate that child by giving that child something, or, or, or here goes a word, when you bless that child by, by taking that child out for dinner or buying them some clothing or some game or whatever it is uh, that is uh, commensurate with uh, the reward, that they deserve for the job they did, that is praise. And that doesn't make God jealous. God isn't jealous when I flirt with my wife or when I compliment her or when we say sweet things to one another. God isn't upset when, when, when I communicate with my children how much I love them and how much they mean to me because God is not insecure. Now, the Bible talks about God being a jealous God, and that has a lot to do with worship. God says when it comes to uh, worship, now that is something you cannot give to another. Thou shalt have no other God before me. Thou shalt, thou shalt worship no graven image. Do not worship any idol that you have made for yourselves. The worship is exclusively reserved for God. But praise, praise is one of those things that depending on how you look at it and how you break it down, praise very well can exist 
as a gift to other people. Now, why do I teach it? I clarify that and I proffer that because we only often deal with one half of praise. We only often prepare people for praise on one side because we tend to conflate praise to only be for God. And if the praise is something, if praise is something that, that we only give, if appreciation is something we only give to God, then we only have to focus on the praise we give. But if we acknowledge that though we're not talking about worship, we're just talking about praise in its common ideology, if we recognize then that admiration, adulation, appreciation, and even affection can be shown to others, then it behooves us not to just focus then on how to give praise. We also need to check how we receive praise. The text I teach from this obscure passage, this small proverbial note in the book of Proverbs is not about the praise we give. It said that just as the crucible or the fining pot is for silver and what the furnace is for gold, so men's hearts are tested by their praise. It's not talking about the praise you give. It's talking about the praise we receive. Both the crucible and the furnace are used to separate impurities from the metal so that the substance of the good or costly uh, metal, i.e. the silver or the gold, is able to live up to its value without the pollution of the trashy metals. When you want to get the pollution out of silver, put it in a refining pot. When you want to get the, the, the pollution out of gold, burn it in a furnace. And when you want to get the pollution out of a heart, test how they handle praise. Good evening. Good evening, class. I said good evening. You say it back. Good evening, class. I want to suggest one simple point out of tonight, and that is that praise has testing power. God says the same way the crucible of the refining pot is used to test the purity of the silver and to purify it, and the same way that the furnace is used to test the purity of the gold and to purify it, I then allow the praise that men receive to show or test what is in their hearts. Now, this means then that we have to wrestle with this question, does God test us? I received a, 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 a text the other day from a friend asking that question. She said, I'm, I'm curious, are we tested by God? And, 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 I, and rather than to just rush to the answer, I started looking it up again, and, and I began to realize that there are actually different schools of thought. That some people say, no, we, we don't get tested by God because God is holy, and so God does not associate with anything evil, and as a result of God being distant from anything evil, then God does not test us because often the things that we are tested with are things in some cases that are just downright evil and are treacherous and are, 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 are um, difficult to deal with. However, I tend to lean on the side that suggests that there too, there's too much scripture to support the idea that God does test Though I believe God is holy and that there is nothing evil about God, I would suggest that the reason why some hold that level of perception is because they don't understand what the test is. Can I teach tonight? I would suggest that if you look at the word for testing or to be tested, in the Old Testament Hebrew word usually is the word uh, bekan, which means to examine, to investigate, to prove, or to scrutinize, ironically. Proverbs 17 and 3 says, fire tests the purity of silver and gold, but the Lord tests the heart. So God does test. 
God does test, but what we need to look at is how God's testing works. When God tests, the tests of God are to examine, to investigate, to prove, or to scrutinize. In the New Testament, the word most often used for test is dokimazo. Uh, uh, okay, dokimazo, and it means to put to the test or to prove, to examine, or even to approve. So for example, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 2 and 4 on the B clause that we aren't trying to please people, but please God who tests the hearts. Now you don't believe me, you go Google scriptures about God testing, and most of the scriptures you will find is that God tests the heart. So then the idea of God testing us isn't so much God's willful decision to put us through scrutinizing situations or horrible situations or that God um, wills evil upon people or calamity upon people. No, in fact, I want to suggest that a lot of what we call the calamity and the evil is really life happening, that there is evil in the earth. And I'll do a whole nother teaching on this, but that there is evil in the earth, that there is calamity in the earth, that in this world. Jesus said, uh, you shall have tribulation. He says, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That what we really are dealing with is that there's just life that we go through in the world. And the test then becomes what we do with our hearts as the result of that calamity. Are you hearing me? So God does not tempt, but God does test. And regardless of the circumstance, God's testing of us is to examine, to prove, and to even approve the state of one's heart. It, it, it's just like health. You can't say you're healthy. You say you're healthy. Oh, I'm healthy. Well, good. Take this EKG, this CAT scan, this X-ray, this mammogram, and let it tell us you're healthy. <laughs> it's there to test, to examine the health you say you have. Well, you say your heart is healthy. Talking about your soul. God says, good. Then let's see how you handle, not just affliction, we're used to that. But this text suggests, let's see how you handle affirmation, flattery, credit, advantage and winning. How you handle those things, Teach Rousen, will tell us the health of your heart. It's like people who walk around saying, oh, I'm humble, I'm humble, I'm humble. Most people who have to announce they're humble probably aren't that humble because when you're really humble, then you don't have to announce it the way you handle people Lord, I'm teaching better than somebody saying amen tonight. The way you handle people will become the indication that humility fills your heart. Are you seeing what I'm saying? And we are used to the idea of the heart being tested in affliction. We are used to the idea of the heart being tested in pain. But what this scripture teaches us in Proverbs 27, 21 is that God actually doesn't use pain as much to test the hearts of men. He says a man is tested, not to say that they can't be tested by how they handle pain. That's good. It was good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn that statues. There's a whole lot of scriptures we can throw at that. We know about pain. I'm just saying that pain doesn't exist alone. That another dimension to see what's in your heart is how you and I handle praise. Somebody ought to type on the line, the power of praise. Yeah, praise has power. I'm not talking about the praise you give God. I'm not talking about the hallelujahs and thank you, Jesus. We know that that praise has power, that God inhabits the praises of his people. No, I'm talking about the praise you get. I'm talking about the praise you receive. I'm talking about the compliments you get. I'm talking about the advantage, the upper hand you get has power in your life when it comes to shaping, refining, and defining character. I was talking not too long ago with, with one of my staff in a casual work conversation. And a uh, staff person noted a thought to me that I digested and then kind of flipped. And they said, how you treat people when you're down says a lot about your character. And, and, and the reference in particular was how you treat people who you perceive are above you when you're down. 
how you handle that that oppression that sense of oppression says a lot about your character and I, and I agree with it but I replied I said yes but you really want to know what what really counts for character I said it's how you treat them when you're finally up how you treat people when you're down indeed says a lot about character how David treated Saul when he was on the run and how Joseph handled his brothers when, 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 when he was on the run and how he handled Potiphar when he was on the run and all of those kinds of things. That says a lot about character. But you know what speaks even louder? What speaks louder is how you treat people who are now under you when you finally get the advantage. Come here again, Joseph. What makes Joseph so powerful in Scripture is not just that he didn't attack his brothers back when they tried to kill him. What, what causes Joseph to really be regarded in scripture is how he treated his brothers once he came into prominence and power and how he was willing to then love them, reveal himself to them, share bread with them in the middle of a famine and look at the same brothers who sold him into slavery and say to them, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good that he might preserve me for this very season so that you could live. I am telling you that God doesn't just test you by how you lose. God tests you by how you act when you win. Good God, my, my master. There are some people, there are some, there are some people, there are some people who, who, who don't do well winning. They were okay when they were losing. They were humble when they were losing. But when they start winning, all of a sudden they get arrogant. And I want to suggest tonight that we know that part. The part we may not always consider is why. I want to suggest to you that perhaps the reason why they find themselves getting arrogant and uppity is, is you know, folks say, oh, child, that was always in their heart. Maybe, maybe not. But, but, but because the Bible did say even of Lucifer that iniquity was found in his heart. It doesn't mean that it was always in his heart. It means it was found in his heart that at some point the, it, it was identified to have taken residence in his heart. I have seen kind hearted people grow bitter. I have seen humble people grow arrogant and prideful. I have seen generous people grow stubborn based upon how they had to handle transitions. Oh, I don't have time. I don't have time. I wish I had time. I don't have the kind of time I wish I had. Um, can I take a moment? Lean into this like this. Most of the time, when it comes to the praise people receive and how it affects their character, it's based off of two things. Either A, the absence of something or the abundance of something is usually the extremes. OK, the the absence of something. Tends to lead to um, an insatiable. Hunger for it, an appetite for it based on the absence of it. So I have this fascination with something this need for something. The abundance of it leads to a sense of entitlement for it and an apathy to anything that doesn't support it. Let me make this plain. So let's say you have a, 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 a grown adult who is just obnoxious. It could either be because they were starved for attention so that's the that's the that's the the absence of it or it could be because they got too much attention as a child and received the abundance and everything was about them and now they've brought the, those tendencies into adulthood and so they have a sense of entitlement where they believe everything is supposed to be for them both can be dangerous both can be dangerous both can be dangerous there's a reason why the bible talks about us living in moderation because too much of anything can kill you. Yeah, too, too much of anything can kill you. That at the end of the day, it's not always that a person lacked something. It could be that a person got too much of something and it created an, a sense of entitlement. On the flip side, it might not always be that that person always had something and that's why they're that way. It could be because they lacked it. You see people who grew up in poverty and they and they really make it big. And the first thing they do is go buy a bunch of Bentleys or go, you know, just blow money, sports, 
um, athletes and people like that, sometimes movie stars who grew up in relative poverty or in poverty outright, and now they made it big, but they run through their money. It's because the absence created this appetite for it, this insatiable hunger that said, if I ever make it, I'm going to do this X, Y, and Z. Somebody else can waste money because they grew up entitled based upon the fact that they always had it. And so because they always had it and mama always had it or daddy always had it or it's been in our family for a long time, then they don't develop a work ethic to do what's necessary to manage and maintain. So as a consequence, they find themselves running through, blowing through what they have because they take for granted how easy it is to get it back. Both are dangerous. And what God says is the same way you can understand that about money. That's how praise works. Praise reveals whether a person's heart is suffering from uh, absence of a thing and the insatiable hunger based on absence, or whether a person's heart is suffering from entitlement based upon overabundance of a thing. This is why the writer writes in Proverbs chapter 30 around verse 8 or 7 or 8 or so and says, Lord, there are two things I ask from you before I die. Number one, help me to never tell a lie and help me to only honor honesty. And number two, he says, give me neither poverty nor riches. He says, I don't want too little and I don't want too much. He says, because if I have too, too much, then I'll ask, where, who is God? Where is God? I don't need a God. And if I have too little, then I may steal to get it and profane the name of my God. Do you see the point I'm trying to raise that God says, I'll give you something and see how, it hand, how you handle it. And some of us are starving to death and others of us are bloating to death and we are obese because we have too much of it. Let me make this plain tonight. There are some of you that God wants to bless on a greater level. God really wants to open doors for you. But the question is going to be, are you willing to make the sacrifice it takes as a posture of the heart to not grow addicted to the attention you get once you get it? Oh, Lord, I want to tell some preacher, God can grow your church. That's no question. The question is, will you treat them like sheep and not just treat them like faces in a crowd to feed your ego so you feel like you're doing a good job? Are y'all hearing what I'm? <sighs> the power of praise. Can I go deeper? I'm going to turn, turn one, two more times. I'm done with this. John 12, 42 and 43. Jesus is, is, is in the midst of... Um, uh, inflamed persecution. All right. In a few days, he'll be dead. There's commotion. He's just coming to the city. There's commotion because he recently healed or raised Lazarus from the dead. And so there's a great argument about belief in him. And verse 42 of John chapter 12 says, nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Many of the rulers would not and could not believe Jesus, despite the signs he did, but among those who did believe, because Isaiah had already prophesied that, that God would make it so that hearing they would not hear, seeing they would not see, because their hearts were already cold. But here's the kicker. Some of the rulers, some of the religious people, some of those in power did believe in Jesus, but they refused to confess it out of fear of the Pharisees because they, so in other words, they refused to acknowledge their belief of Jesus in the open. Here's why. It said in verse 43, because they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Praise is so powerful that the craving for approval, the craving for affirmation, the craving for acknowledgement of others can make some people settle to live with private convictions that never become public confessions about God. You'd be surprised how many people deep down really do believe. But they refuse to confess where they stand on a thing because they benefit by being silent. You'd be surprised how many of your co-workers really 
do believe that racism is real and that it's not right, but they refuse to acknowledge that openly because they don't want to mess up the trajectory they're on in, in the climb for upward mobility occupationally and corporately. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There are people who will know that we ought to stand for righteousness or holiness, but they won't say anything because they don't want to lose popularity with certain people. There are people who will know that regardless to gender, a person ought to be treated fairly, but they won't say anything because they benefit from a system that marginalizes women or marginalizes people by other parts or statuses in life. Yeah, I could go on and on and on, but the reality is that there are some people who sadly fit this context. And, and what praise is revealing out of their heart is that they care more about the applause of people than they care about the applause of God. One writer said praise is a fiery trial for persons. If a man has a base or weak character, praise will make him proud, conceited and overbearing. If a man has a precious or strong character, he said it will not affect him at all. He will continue in his modest and humble course, glorifying God and being thankful for any good that he might be able to, to do toward others. Praise, hear this, creates a severe test of your soul. Praise will reveal what kind of person you are. It will prove a spirit of godly humility or a spirit of devilish pride. Do you crave the praise of men? Does it greatly warm your soul or do you know full well that it's not quite true? Do you fear it? Do you fully understand that anything you are or have is a gift from God? I'm telling you tonight, I'm begging you tonight that amidst the various dynamics you may already be including into your personal devotion, I am encouraging you to, to take a minute and just observe how you respond to praise. Does praise pull out the good in your character and make you more humble or does praise feed a need? to be puffed up. Furthermore, I want you to examine which of the two, if it boils down to it, will you fight the hardest for? The praise of men or the praise of God? Wait, 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 wait. See, I'm trying to close, I'm trying to close. Wait, 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 wait. I didn't know God was a praiser. Woo. Can I say finally, before I give you my last little scripture and get out of here, that, that you didn't know it, but God is a praiser too. <laughs> this is what Jesus really meant in the Sermon on the Mount when he kept saying, uh, uh, blessed are you when, blessed are you. It translates happy. Jesus is giving out praise tokens to people in certain conditions. <laughs> yeah, God is a praiser too. And the text says outright in John 12, 43, that it's possible that you can believe God, but because of a craving for the praise of men, we'll end up wanting the praise of men more than the praise of God. I'm asking you, which praise are you aiming for? When you live your life, which praise are you aiming for? What's your goal? Are you doing it? to the glory of God, or are you doing it to get some sense of credit or credibility with mankind? Because when you, and here's my last turn, when the praise of men gets high, then the praise of God will not be heard. And to the contrary, when the praise of men is at its lowest, that is when the praise of God just might be at its loudest. I want to take my last five or six minutes and talk to somebody who's living through a season where nobody seems to recognize you, where for all the good you do, it seems you never get the praise of men, that for all of the greatness that you're trying to accomplish, for just your survival and staying in the fight, it seems nobody ever really gives you just due recognition. I want to tell you that when the praise of men is at its lowest, the praise of God is at its highest. I 
I know you need some Bible for that because that already sounds weird to, for me to say God is a praiser. So then let me give you some Bible and I'm going to pack up and leave. The Bible says in Acts chapter 7 around verses 54 through 60 uh, uh, talks about a man named Stephen who was uh, uh, it, ideally the uh, a deacon in the early church and the first martyr in the book of Acts. The Bible talks about after he told his testimony and basically preached to those Jewish uh, men and leaders and rulers that they sought to persecute him and were getting ready to stone him. It said when they heard the things he said, they were cut to the heart. They gnashed with their teeth. But the Bible says in verse 55 of Acts chapter 7 that Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed up into heaven. Hallelujah. And the Bible said he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, look, I see the heavens open and the son of man standing at the right hand of God. They stoned him. They killed him. But his final words as he knelt down was, Lord, receive my spirit because he saw the Lord giving him a standing ovation. It's the praise of God. Lord, help me because I'm trying to close here, but I'm telling you this. Now, to understand that, you have to understand that when Jesus died, being our high priest, and he ascended back to the Father, that the Bible says he is seated on the right hand of the Father. Jesus is seated. The fact that he is seated is a sign that his priestly work is done. Because throughout the Old Testament, and even going into the New Testament, as far as the days and times of Jesus, for the Jews, that their priests never never sat down. There were no pulpit chairs because the priest's job was never finished. So Jesus is the first sitting priest because it describes the fact that his work was finished. The only time in scripture that we see Jesus, hallelujah, getting up off of his throne, leaving his seat to stand up again was not to do more work, was not to die again. It was not to pardon. It was to praise. Jesus, hallelujah, got up out of his seat to give a standing ovation to the man who stood up for him. And I close tonight. I'm done and I thank you for tolerating my folly for the last 40 minutes. But I am telling you under the sound of my voice that if you would decide today to live your life for the praise of God and not for the praise of men, then God told me to tell you when the praise of men is at its lowest, the praise of God will be at its loudest. God says, if you are willing to focus on the right thing, then I will stand up for who stands up for me. I'm telling you to chase after God because when God praises you, He'll turn your whole life around. When God praises you, he'll pick you up and turn you around. When God praises you, God will take your application and put it at the front and at the top of the stack. When God praises you, God will let you qualify for stuff you really didn't qualify for. When God praises you, God will give exceeding abundantly above all you may ask or think. When God praises you, God will make up for every loss that you endured. When God praises you, God said, I'll restore the years hallelujah to God that the canker worm and the caterpillar and the locusts have eaten when God praises you God will cause your latter days to be greater than your former days when God praises you okay maybe praise is a word that you struggle with then let me change that word and use another word we often use for praise when God blesses you God said I will bless you blessing I will bless thee and multiplying I will multiply thee God says when I stand up for you then no weapon formed against you shall prosper when God stands up for you and praises you and stands in your corner and blesses you then it doesn't matter how many people are against you greater is he in me than he that is in the world when God praises God's praise is permanent this is the power of praise God says, if I want to get the purest out of silver, I put it in a refining pot. And if I want to get purity out of gold, the impurity out of gold to get the best in that gold, I put it in a furnace and I burn it. And when I want to separate the impurities from your life, I'll put you in a season where people start praising you. 
And if you start seeing impurities come up, then that's when you cry out to God, creating me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Who needed this word tonight? It's the power of praise. Watch how you handle praise. And if there are any areas in your life where the praise you've received has produced something that's not godly, ask the Lord to help you. I want to pray. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I, I, I ask that you would help us purify, test, examine, scrutinize, prove, and then approve our hearts. We open our hearts before you. Lord, I don't ever want to get so hungry for applause, so needy for affirmation. I don't ever want to become, Lord, so, so caught up on what people say that I start craving that more than the praise of God. I got to get myself together. I got to get myself together. I got to get myself together. Lord, help me to get myself together so that I don't ruin the, 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 the destiny you have for me. Help me to get myself together so that my heart will grow at the same pace of, as my life. I got to get myself together. Lord, purify me so that I'll be pleasing to you. Help me, Lord, to not be like those rulers who succumbed to the praise of men. Help me instead to be like Stephen who when he could have simply changed his message to be accepted by his comrades, instead, he decided to stand for you. And because he stood for you, you stood for him. I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Accept the Lord right now as your savior. Pray with me. God, I come in the name of Jesus and I confess you are the savior of the world. I believe that Jesus died for my sin. I believe that he rose on the third day. Come into my heart, purify my heart, sanctify my heart. I believe that by your grace, through my faith, I am saved right now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, or if you rededicated your heart back to the Lord, I want you to text SKC Decision to 71441. Yes, we do have people who text us. We have people in virtual space who give their life to Christ, who become a part of our church, who rededicate their lives. You won't be the first, and I believe by faith you won't be the last. Connect with us right now and let us know you prayed that prayer with us and accepted Christ in your heart. We're going to follow up with you, all right? If you want to be a blessing to the ministry, again, I'm challenging you to just sow into the ministry. Be a blessing. I don't talk about it much, particularly in this platform. I try to make it easy and that I don't have to pressure people to give, but I'm challenging you to anything you have. Be a blessing to the ministry. I believe that the ministry is being a blessing to you. Most importantly, allow God to test your heart. Keep standing up for God so that you will receive the praise of God. That is the power of praise. Have a strong day.